you would turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the book of Colossians, excuse me, Philippians. That's good, I'm glad you're chuckling, that means you're, you know where we're supposed to be. We'll get to Colossians next week. As you're turning your Bibles, I forgot to make a, a VBS announcement, Vacation Bible School. There is a list in your bulletin of all these things that we need uh, donated as a part of what we'll be doing this week. And there's a little table over by the uh, Welcome Center, and uh, it has little postums with all this stuff listed on it. And so if you could, if you want to take some of those and say, I'll, I'll declare I'm going to bring this, that would be fantastic. If you can't bring anything, but you just want to donate some finances to that, there's a basket there for that as well. Last Sunday, we heard the Apostle Paul say to the church in Philippi, May make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. We pick up that theme again in a more personal way in Philippians 4, 1 through 13, that we're going to look at this morning. Peace is one of the earmarks of Christianity. It truly is a beacon of Christ's life. And to remain in peace means we have to stay basking in the sunlight. To bask means to remain in the sunlight, to soak up its rays and its heat. If you're at the beach under an umbrella, you are not basking in the sunlight. Basking means you're always in the light. We're going to look at that this morning using that term basking in the sunlight as a kind of um, uh, illustration. But I want to share with you just recent experiences, a kind of an illustration as we get going this morning. Last night was our Hibbing Parade and Street Dance. And I um, appreciate Chris Anderson actually went out during the night along with me and some other chaplains and other people from the Chemical uh, Health Committee. And we were observing our street dance. What is it? What happens? What do they do? I've never been to a street dance. And after going last night, I understand why. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not into the, the music that they're playing, and I'm not into the alcohol that they're serving. So last night, it was an it was a eye-opener. I was walking the, the street with two other chaplains. We were dressed in our chaplain attire. And um, I'm going to share just some of the things I, uh, that I, I saw, okay? Number one, we got there about 10 o'clock in the evening, and everything was, I mean, it was pretty much a festival, a, a, a gathering, a social environment, uh, what, it, what it's intended to be. And uh, even though I'm not one who drinks alcohol, people that do, I mean, if they do it in, in moderation, you know, it's, you know, for some people, they drink coffee. For others, they were there. They're, they're used to drinking alcohol, and they were doing it very responsibly. Around 11.30, that changed. And those that were responsible were going, you know, i got to go home tonight, and i got to get up in the morning, I hope, <laughs> for church or, or whatever. But, but that crowd began to leave, and then the other crowd, the party crowd, remains. And so we walked last night till around 1 o'clock, just to visualize what was going on. Now, everything shuts down at midnight, except the bars. Everything in the street shuts down, and then if you're going to continue to drink, you have to go in the bars. You heard me say this before, and I'll just mention it to you because I want you to be alert what happens in our own community, that uh, every single police officer on the force has to be active duty last night because there are not enough officers to go around for what happens in the community during the street dance. We have state troopers that were there last night. We have cadets that were there last night that are at the HCC. And we had the Virginia police also patrolling the streets of Hibbing last night. Uh, and, they, and then when they have their street dance, some of our guys go over there. So obviously, our law enforcement are very concerned about what happens. So what, we're, what I was doing last night was just walking around. I was supposed to take a, a survey kind of thing and, and check on how many people were getting drunk. And from 10 to 11.30, it was like, well, there's one, there's one. Around 11.30, 12 o'clock, I decided to count how many weren't. 
because it was easier. Now, there, I mean, and, and, and I don't know how drunk they were getting, but they were, they were becoming induced by the alcohol. That's what I'm saying, okay? Their eyes are glazed over. Some people are acting like complete idiots because they allow alcohol to do that. Some are having relationship issues, um, sitting in the middle of the street. Obviously, it's blocked off. There's no vehicles going. Um, Chris said that she went off the main street and around the back, and there were people that were getting sick on their own feet and this kind of thing. Not what you want as a representation of this is our city. And again, I want to come back to the fact that not everybody, not everybody that went to street dance was doing this. Okay, I did see teenagers walking around because they have to leave when the curf curfew's up. But I'm thinking all this is doing for them is training them, this is what we do for fun when you become an adult. And it was sad. Because you watch at the hopelessness of so many people. I had one gentleman uh, in particular that, I mean, I'm, I've got my badge on, so I look copish, if you will. I've got my shirt on that says law enforcement chaplain, but it's in a badge style. And I got two other guys that have their badges on, and a guy comes up, looks me straight in the eye, and grabs a piece of garbage and throws it at me. And I stop and look at him. And then he looks down and sees the badge, not knowing that I'm not a cop. He goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, why did you do that? I'm drunk. <laughs> now, I share all that because I could, we could live in the misery of the sin that's in within our community. And we could, and I'm going to get to this in a little bit as we get to the message, we could, we could walk around saying, oh, we got such a, such a terrible environment and we have negative things happening. But I want to share with you again that God is still on the throne. We, greater is he that is in us that is in the world. Does my heart bleed for our city after watching that last night? Absolutely. I watch a young man escorting his father that was so drunk he couldn't walk a straight line if his life depended on him. He's trying to get his dad home safe. I watched a, a couple that were having an argument in the middle of the street. And then they sit on the ground and they're weeping and crying. And it's all induced by the, the dullness, in this case, of the alcohol. The substance abuse, if you will. We're watching people that, I, if I was more vocal, I would tell people, get a room. I don't need to see this. Nobody needs to see this. You understand what you're doing, what the, the image you're projecting right now? But that's what happens when you become drunk. And that scripture says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that's the negative side, and I don't want to leave it there. Because I believe that God can revive and change and transform our community if we decide that we truly are going to be the light of Jesus Christ, that we are going to make a difference in our community, not because we get them to come to church, because the church is called to go out and be a witness, not sit and wait for someone to show up at our door. And so I'm going to encourage you as we get going, be light. You were once in darkness, you know what that is, but now you're children of light. Live, be a testimony, walk as children of light. Now let me, show you some, let me share something else with you. This last week, some of you know this, some of you don't, I spent uh, most of the week in Texas, near uh, Dallas. It's called, a place called Grapevine. I was getting trained in a thing, it was for the uh, International Conference of Police Chaplains, but I was being trained by Homeland Security to instruct other people about different things like death notification and, and uh, ride-along protocol and just things of that nature that pertain to chaplains. But it was like a flashback to college because everything they taught me in college, there it was. Here's the outline. You've got to have the premise of where you're going and you're, and you're speaking. You've got to have the conclusion. You have to have the body. You have to have these elements. And it's like, wow, I haven't done this for a long time. And realized, and maybe you do too, yeah, you haven't done this for a long time because we never see it in the sermon. You just kind of ramble. So that, that class was designed, and it was. It was a class. It was, uh, you had to have the guys from Homeland Security 
check off your 30-minute uh, presentation review, and then you had to check off your outline, and then you had to make a presentation for 30 minutes to your class. It was, it was school. But here's the unique thing I want to share with you. This is where I want to let you know there's security in Jesus Christ, and, as though, and though we see our, our, the negativity of what goes on in the, in the dark in our community, and we, see, and we hear the negativity of what goes on in our country, these are the people that are protecting us at the highest level. That we had three instructors from Homeland Security. All three of them were assigned to this training. They had been on teams before, together. All three of them were believers in Jesus Christ. Now, their supervisors did not assign them to this because of that. They grabbed those three and said, we want you to go down to Texas. I had an opportunity one evening after, after a banquet that we had. One of the guys, one of our instructors, came to our table, and, um, and I was trying to be light to everybody. So uh, and understand, with the International Conference of Police Chaplains, you have those that believe Christ is salvation to the world, and you have those that maybe you're religious in that regard, and you've got those that believe something totally different. And I'm sitting at a table, and fortunately it was with our chaplain, so I know where they stand and so forth. And one of our instructors came by, and we said, hey, why don't you come join us? And so he just stopped by. We were talking, and a couple of our chaplains um, had some alcohol, got a little lightheaded, and they went back to their rooms. And uh, eventually it was just me and the instructor. And he was telling me now on a more personal basis about where he works in Homeland Security. He said, Kevin, um, it's so good to be a believer. He said, my colleagues, some of my colleagues are also believers. We have a prayer meeting every Thursday at 3 o'clock. About a half dozen people come and pray for those who come to our classes and for our country. He says, I've been the recipient of being healed twice in my office or in my, my workplace by other fellow Christians that I work with. He's one time in particular, it was, it was terminal. And he said, we got done teaching a class in the morning and then they break for lunch. And when they break for lunch, that's their time. They don't have to deal with the students. They get to relax. And there's, his supervisor came over, one of his supervisors came over and said, Mike, uh, we're having a meeting and we need you to be at this meeting. And he said, I was kind of grumbling under my breath, like, this is my time. I'm not supposed to go to meetings at my lunch hour. And he went into the room where he was told to go, and there was a, t a chair in the middle of the room, and there were 16 Homeland Security Christians. And they said, Mike, sit in that chair so that we can pray that God would heal you. He did, and God did heal him. This trip I just went on gave me, you know, I, I think maybe it was this grand illustration that God was giving me about the sermon I'm about to give to you. Because I, when I usually go to these trainings, like I said, it, it's more of the, the methodology of being a good chaplain. Not what are you going to say or how are you going to minister, but rather how are you going to act and and those kind of things, within the confines of the fact that we can't proselytize, the only time we can uh, do that kind of thing is if someone begins to ask questions. We can't just launch into it and go, hey, are you a Christian? We can't do that. But we can be there to minister and to be, a, and be a, a, in a pastoral role, and then if people ask, we can share Christ. So it's a little frustrating at times. But this year, this conference I went to had more elements of ministry than I have ever experienced. And it was all on the side. It wasn't in the classes. It was on the sidebar. One day, they have a, what's called a mixer. And in the mixer, you know, you have hot wings and some other kind of foods to eat. And, and then all the tables were taken, except for the stand-up tables. And so I'm standing next to my roommate, who I'd never, ever met before until I got to Texas, and a nice, strong Christian from the Methodist background. And then 
uh, the man next to me I had met the year before because of the fact that he was, um, he had taught at a training we had the year before. He's from Nebraska. This other man, my roommate's from Texas. Another man's from Oklahoma. Another man's from Canada. And, uh, and the guy from Oklahoma said, guys, he says, when you get an opportunity, will you pray for Sarah? So I'm really concerned about Sarah. I can't go into details. I'm just concerned about Sarah. Sure. And what happens when you're in a group and that happens? Will you pray for Sarah? Sure. And then you go do what? Start talking. You know, you, you keep talking about different things, what you're learning and so forth. And it was compelling on me because God has taught me over the years, if someone says, please pray, then you pray. And so after about five minutes, I said, Ken, I really feel compelled to pray. Now, I don't know these guys that well. I don't know what their background is. I said, do you mind if I just pray for Sarah? Ken said, that'd be great. I start praying. I learn instantly where these guys stood with Christ. It was a prayer meeting in the middle of this mixer where these guys are agreeing and lifting up a woman they've never met before because she needed help. That's the power of Jesus Christ. Remember when we talked about the name of Christ, the name that's above every other name? Well, in ICPC, when you get up in public and you pray for people, you're supposed to be politically correct. You, know, pray to, you can use the name God, but don't go very far beyond that. You know, Everybody believes in some higher power. We had dignitaries there from Kenya who are with the International Conference of Police Chaplains. She got up, and this girl was preaching while she was praying, and she was doing it in the name of Jesus. She was shouting from the top of her lungs, in the name that is no other name, the name of Jesus. I offer this prayer. <laughs> we had a man sitting next to me, and he said, oh boy, we're going to hear, <laughs> he says, we're going we're gonna to hear about that one. I haven't yet. Anyway, I'm just sharing these stories with you because there is the darkness and there is the light. There is the light. One other story, and I know I'm sharing all stories for you and get to the, the meat of this. Some of you saw my Facebook uh, page. We were sitting at a restaurant, and there was, again, it was, it was so cool because you could tell where people were from just by their accent. I was from Minnesota. We had one guy from Oklahoma. We had another guy from South Carolina. We had a man from Canada, and then there was, uh, and then our friend from Nebraska. And uh, we're developing relationships now, friends in Christ. And we sit down at the table. We're in the back of this restaurant, and uh, we order. And then we said, "Guys, why don't we?" You know, someone said, "Why don't we pray before the food comes?" And so we bowed our head to pray. After we get done praying, there's a table over here with two, uh, probably forty-ish, maybe even thirty, late thirties. Sharp-looking guys, and we got done praying, and they both turned and looked at us like this and gave us a thumb up. We thought maybe they were from the conference, because it's a lot of people. After we get done eating, these guys were finished, and they're about to leave, and our guy, our, one of the guys in the end, Jeff, he, he says, hey, guys, just curious, where are you from? And they said, well, we are, we're, we're uh, from Orange County, California. We're pilots for a rich man uh, who owns a Falcon jet. And so we, he's here, and so we flew him here. And, um, and so we're just having dinner together while he's doing his business. And we talked and talked about Christ. Understand what's happening. Men who have never met before have an instant bond because of Christ who is in us. We said, it was great to meet you. They had to go. They left. And about two minutes later, one of the guys came back. And he said, guys, uh, we attend, we have a home church. And, and there's only about 14 of us or so forth in our church back home. But we commit to praying for chaplains. Do you mind if I pray for you? We're in a public restaurant. It is packed. He gets down on one knee. And he prays for five minutes. And he's not hiding that he loves Christ. This is the man of light. He knows what it was to be in darkness. But now he's the light of the Lord. He didn't care what the other people there were thinking. 
says, I'm on a mission that God's given us. We have committed to pray for men like you, and we're going to pray. Folks, the reason I share this is this is what it is to be the light of Jesus Christ. These men are not pastors. They're not the people that are supposed to do this. These are laymen who fly this expensive equipment across the country for a guy that has lots of money. But they maintain their faith and they keep it whether they're at home or whether they're across the country. This is what God calls for all of us to be and to do. We were once in darkness. We understand what it is to be separated from God and to walk around with no hope. We understand, some of you even understand what it's like to be at the street dance before you knew Christ. And you, and you have this, this, this is it. This is, this is why I come because this is all I can do and tomorrow will be a ucky day again. But for a moment in time, I can feel like there's something going on. We cannot be effective lights if we do not bask in the light. And we cannot bask while in the shadows of rivalry. What I mean by that is one of the most of the things, we talked about peace last time. The Apostle Paul did. Remember he said, well, I want you to be of one mind and one spirit. I want you to be the same love, united in spirit, intent to one purpose. I want you to be unified. He comes back to that here. And in chapter 4 of Philippians, he begins to actually name a couple of girls or ladies by name. In Philippians 4, he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, whom I long to see, my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord. Oh, that's Philippians. Sorry, that's next week. Right chapter, wrong book. Is that Philippians? Yeah, yeah, I was in the right chapter. Oh, I was in Philippians. Man, I'm, I was up till one, walking the streets of Hibbing. Come on. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. If I was in my class, I just lost a point. <laughs> Therefore, my beloved brothers, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Udia. And I urge Synthic to live in harmony in the Lord. Okay, he calls out two ladies by name. He says, indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He's talking now to these ladies and he's talking about peace. Remember, he's carrying that theme over. And he says, if you want peace within the family of God, then you have to live in peace. What does he remind these ladies of? He reminds them they're part of the family of God. He says, your names are in the book of life. If you're, we don't know what their problem is. We don't know what their rivalry is. We don't, we don't know what their argument is. It could be that, you know, it could be that, uh, you know, they both like the same guy. I don't know. It could be that their children said something to each other and now they're mad at each other. It, you know the pettiness of humanity. It could be a number of anything. But the Apostle Paul writes to them, and basically, if I can paraphrase, he's saying, we don't have time for this. We are light in a dark world. So stand firm in the Lord. Do what God has called you to do. Live in harmony, because the harmony that we live in then is witnessed by those who are living in a very unstable and hopeless environment. They can see peace in you. If they can see joy in you. If they can see the stability in you, then they see the light of Christ shining through you and me. And then he speaks to the church and he says, help these women. Not hurt them. Not pound on them. Not criticize them. But help them. Guide them. Enable them to see that you, we can't afford in this world to have these petty differences. There's too much at stake and there's too many people needing Christ. In Philippians 2.2, 2, which we covered last time, 
We just read this at the opener. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintain the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. We are responsible for one another. We have the joy and the responsibility if someone is, is out of order in terms of their spiritual responsibility, we have the responsibility and the joy to lovingly attempt to help them see that there needs to be a correction. Not take sides in the argument. Not water down, well, I'll be praying for you, goodbye. And then go home and tell our spouse, whoa, there's an explosion about to happen there. But to lovingly say to someone, and this is very, very hard, because we've got to make sure we're right with God too, right? But to go to someone that you care for and say, you know what? Right now, you are driving toward a cliff. And if I don't intervene, you're going to crash. And probably you're going to hurt other people when you do. Because the response, I mean, obviously, we would love the response to be, oh, 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 thank you. Oh, I should have seen this coming. Thank you. But sometimes the response is, mind your own business. God told me to do this or some other excuse or some other reason of why I can act ungodly for God. Paul says, help these folks. Lovingly, but confrontationally in a positive way. The reality is you can't bask while the shadow, we're in the shadows of worry. What is it when we have negativity in us? What is it? It's because we are worried or we are fearful or we're in a position where we're not trusting God with something. And so we're going to take it upon ourselves to express ourselves about that thing. To bask in the light of Christ, when we're in the light of Christ, and listen to me closely because I don't mean that we just know about Christ. We're not under the umbrella at the beach. We're in the light. And when we're in the light of Christ, we cannot worry. Not that we shouldn't worry. It's impossible to worry when we're basking in Christ. I want that to sink in because you're going, well, I think, well, no. No. If we truly are basking in Christ, if we truly are reliant upon Him, we may not know the outcome of what's going on in life, but we, don't, we won't be in the worry because we'll know that Christ is on the throne. It says here in verse 4, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. That is an, that is an attitude, not an emotion. How do you rejoice when you lose a loved one? How do you rejoice when you're given by the doctor bad news? How do you rejoice when a family member is going through an extremely tough time? How do you rejoice in those circumstances? You have to not listen to your emotions, but lean on Jesus Christ. You have met people like that. We have people here like that. I remember when years and years and years and years ago, when my brother Mike was bringing his two children home from the babysitter and came across an intersection in a cornfield and got side, hit from the side, and he said, I could feel as I'm holding my daughter, the life evaporate from her. That was 30 some years ago. How do you rejoice in that? I don't know, but I watch my brother. I watch him press in closer to God. I watch him say within his heart, I miss her so much, but I rejoice in Christ. How is that possible? Because it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. We are to be satisfied 
in Christ. And when we are, that becomes contagious. Let your gentle spirit, verse 5, be known to all men. The Lord is near. Have you ever had someone come up to you and say to you in your lifetime, when you're going through a difficult time, how come you always seem to be okay? You're always smiling. Or you're always, you always seem to be positive about life. Why is that? How do you answer? I wouldn't be able to do this. I wouldn't be this way if it weren't for Christ. He is my hope. He is my rock. He is my peace. Do not focus on the problems. I, I, uh, I, I share this one with so many people. When I was a young pastor, I was dealing with some stuff emotionally and, and, and even temptation-wise. And, and it's kind of like, you know, I know where I'm supposed to keep my thoughts. Remember last week we talked about different things like that. And it's like, okay, God, how do you get past this? I mean, as a young man especially... You know, you're, you're still growing, you're still learning, you're still trying to develop yourself, but now this young man is in the ministry. He's supposed to be the example to everybody. And so I'm thinking, okay, Lord, how do I, how do I, um, one of the things my wife shared with me years and years and years ago, and I didn't see it and I didn't believe it. And she says, you know, you flirt with other women. And I'm being in my 20s, and I'm going, no, I don't. I'm, I'm just being, having fun. I'm just, I'm just being, um, whatever the word is. <laughs> my wife said, flirtatious? And it, was, and it was, as I look back, it was, you know what? It was. It wasn't just being funny or it wasn't just being kind. There was a flirtation that I was involved with. And if I'm going to be a good husband, if I'm going to be a good dad, if I'm going to be a good pastor, I can't, I can't demonstrate that imagery because if my wife sees it, other people are seeing it too. Now, I had no intent of leaving my wife, but... I am committed to my wife, and therefore I had to have a change. How do you change that? How do you look at the opposite sex with respect? How do you do that without thinking in those, especially in the early years of your life, I want to be like to be with that person. I want to be like if I married that person. I want to be like if I was dating that person. And all those things go through when you're younger. And this passage of scripture came to mind first year I was in ministry. And so every day, every day, I, this, was the, this is what I would do. I would start with Philippians chapter 4, and then I would go to Ephesians chapter 6. Philippians 4 says this. Now it's talking a lot about being anxious, about worry, or so forth. But it says, be anxious for nothing. Don't be worried. Don't be filled with angst and anxiety about anything. But in everything... By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You, we Remember the quote we read in the, in the bulletin about the discipline of prayer? That's, where, that's what this is all about. We can overcome prayer anything when we're basking in the light. When we're reveling in Christ. That reveling isn't just walking away, whistling, going, I'm a Christian, hallelujah, and that is a hallelujah. But it's in the word of God. It's praying to God. It's seeking God. I literally made this for a year. I made this a daily ritual for me. In my, when I'd get to my office, I would pray and I would say, God, I want to rejoice in you today, and I rejoice in you today. And that was great on days that were good. It was hard on days that were bad. But I, but I did it anyway from an attitude of discipline, not from how I felt. And then I went through the process, and I encourage you to do the same thing in your lives. Lord, I am not going to be worried today. I know I'm not sure how I'm going to pay the bill. Especially in the first church I was in, we made $125 a week, I think it was. And I know back in 1982 that was, seemed like a lot, but it wasn't a lot back then, trust me. We had, in our first year of marriage, we had the miracle box. It was called the mailbox, because every time we prayed and asked God for help, the miracle box had something in it. But that's because, I believe in part, 
we begin the discipline, and anybody can do this, is this isn't a pastoral thing, and began to say, Lord, I want, I'm going to lay this at the cross of Jesus. Whatever the problem is, whatever the anxiety is, I'm going to lay it at the cross of Christ. I'm going to begin with prayer. Father, I am calling upon you. I'm leaving this with you. Prayer and supplication. The supplication is, first of all, I'm going to come to you, and secondly, I will make my request known to you. And you, your part, your promise is that you then will pour on me peace, even in the diff most difficult time of my life. There will be an inner peace. You will guard my, my mind from wandering to where it shouldn't go. We are not to focus on the problems is what that is saying. And there's the formula for peace, prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, and requests. And the result is peace. 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 Our responsibility is to be light. By the way, Ephesians 6 is putting on the full armor of God. That was the rest of my ritual in the morning. And I would literally go through every element of the armor of God and I would dress myself like I would put on my socks and my shoes and the whole nine yards. In Ephesians chapter 8, we read these words. For you were formerly darkness... Sound familiar? But you're a light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Kenneth Wooth, it was such a great quote, I wanted to put it in your notes. Anxious care is out of place in a heavenly Father's presence. That's why we want to bask in the light. You can't bask while in the shadows of uncertainty. In verses 10 it says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now at last you have revived your concerns to me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. He's talking now to the Philippians who have repeatedly provided the resources necessary for Paul to continue on his missionary journey. Not that I want to speak from want. Listen closely to what Paul says. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is easy for us when we have an abundance to praise God. I'm paying my bills. I'm paying my mortgage, I'm paying my utility bill, I'm paying for food, I'm paying for my car, I'm paying for my insurances, you know, I'm putting money away for college, I got a vacation fund, everything's going along really nice, thanks God. And how's the response? That's why I, we want to give God glory in everything. So when those things go along, I almost feel guilty, I go, God is good. He is good. But is he only good because he is, I'm in a place where everything's being provided? When things are not going so well, when the car breaks down, and when maybe uh, you know, we don't have enough food at the, end of the, at the end of the money or whatever it is, and do we walk around going, God is good? Because he is still good. He hasn't changed who he is. Our circumstances may have changed. He's still aware of what's going on in our life. But now we have to press in with thanksgiving, supplication, prayer, praise, and continue to be light of Jesus Christ. So that when someone else is going through a hard time, sees how we handle it, they ask that question, how did you deal with that in your life? How did you get through that? Christ in me, my hope and glory. God and God alone. We are frail humans and we cannot deal with life on our own. And when we leave the, the light and we go under the umbrella, if you will, the shadows, we will begin to have a, a facsimile of faith. We'll say, God is good, but all things are so bad. God is good. But 
I don't feel so good. You understand what I'm saying? There's a difference between reality and feigning our faith in Christ. Faith in Christ, not that we don't share prayer requests, we do. But we don't use God's name in order to cover our normal action. That is an offense to God, by the way. A person that truly is content in all things, no matter what they're going through, praises God in the midst of it. Now, listen, I'll be very frank with you. And my name is not even Frank. I'll be very frank with you. Um, I don't remember who I had this conversation with. I think it was somebody from here. But we were talking about, oh, it was, with, it was with Noah when he was in the hospital last week. And talking to Noah and Brooke. And they were talking, he was talking about how intense this pain was that he was having. And I said, no, I've never had pain like that. And they looked at me like, never? Of course, Brooke has because she's given birth. <laughs> they, you ladies, you all know what that is. And he said, never? I said, no, I'm a very blessed man in that regard. I've never gone through that pain. And if I was someone that didn't trust God or someone that was superstitious, like, I mean, even some of you might go on, oh, pastor, you should have never said that. You know, there are, there are Christians out there that still walk in that way, you know. I don't want to say too much because I'm afraid then God will give it to me. Trust me. I prayed. You know, I said at times, God never sent me to Hawaii. Guess what? He never has. <laughs> I don't know what some of those sufferings are. I mean, obviously I know the losing my niece when she was five, that was a heavy pain, emotional pain. You know, having my mom with dementia, that is an emotional pain. Um, you know, we've gone through Darcy's mother died when Darcy was 14 years of age. That's a, an emotional pain. And can I share this, how she died? Do you mind? You know, and, and Darcy was 14 years old, and her and I were dating. That's, I was 16, she was 14. We've been together ever since. Pretty cool. But at that time, her mother was having some issues with her dad, and she went out to the garage and closed all the windows and turned on the car and took her own life. It's painful. How do you rejoice in those kind of things? You don't get giddy. You don't walk around like you're a fool, but you walk around with the peace of knowing that God's still in control, and that he will get me through this, and I will not let the enemy rob me of my joy and my contentment and my peace, because he is the destroyer of life. Therefore, I must bask in the light, and we can't bask while in the shadows of uncertainty. Faith is generous. That's what chapter 10 said. Or verse 10 said, they're supplying all of our needs. Faith is generous. Faith is content. Faith is consistent. It isn't just when we're doing things are going well. Faith is confident. One of the discussions we had at that table when we were having that mixer is we're talking about issues of faith. And all the pastors were agreeing and saying the same thing. If you can plan on it, if you can figure it out, it isn't faith. Faith isn't that which I know it's going to work this way because this is, this is all in a row. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, but nothing yet experienced, not yet seen the result. i got to trust God by faith. When I say that God created the earth and the universe and he did it in six days, i got to believe that by faith. When I say that my God is only one God, existing in three personalities, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, i got to believe that by faith. When I say that God became man and dwelled among us and was put to death but came back to life and through his shed blood, I can have redemption from my sins, I don't know how that works. I can only believe that by faith. When I say that a friend of mine who is going to die doesn't know Christ and will be eternally lost forever and ever unless they come to faith in Christ, I believe that by faith. I don't want to believe it, but I know it's true because that's what God's word has shared with me. 
And the flip side, of course, is I can believe by faith that those who are followers of Christ will have eternity with God as adopted children because God said it is true. We are to walk not by what we see the scripture says, but by faith. Listen to that. Common sense is ruled out here in terms of earthly common sense. Common sense says, don't go into the dark room without a flashlight. You may stub your toe, you may bump your head. Common sense says, don't do that. Faith says, go into this bright light that's so bright you can't see anything and believe that God will take care of you. And so we step out by faith. We rejoice by faith. We live out these principles by faith. To bask is to remain in the sunlight, to soak up its rays and its heat, not covered by a beach umbrella, by a towel, or even a heavy garment. We are exposed to all that Christ has for us. We live a life of peace with each other as well as with ourselves. To do that, we need to bask in the light of Jesus Christ. For our peace is a light beacon of hope to a dark world of unrest. You know what it is to walk in darkness. You were once in darkness. I was once in darkness. But now we're light in the Lord. Therefore, we should live as though we truly are light of the Lord. Remaining in the light at all times. Trusting God in all things. Serving Him regardless of the situation in life. Basking in the light of Christ. You do that, folks, very simply. To bask in the light is to live according to the principles of God's Word, which means we have to be knowing God's Word, living in God's Word. And through that prayer, the Holy Spirit will reveal to us and illuminate to us the truths of God's Word. He will call upon us to do things that sometimes we don't want to do. He will call upon us to be a bright light in the midst of a dark situation. But that's when Christ shines the most. That's when the light shines the brightest, is when a room is dark. So be light. Be an example of Christ. Rejoice in Him always. Again, I'll say it. Rejoice. Let's pray. Worship team, will you come? Heavenly Father, thanks for these experiences in life that we come across every day. Some of them are very, very difficult experiences. Some of them have lasting consequences on our days on earth. Some of them, Lord, we want to reach out and grab people and help them understand there's a better life. Some are people walking in hopelessness. Some of us get so focused on our negative experiences we forget to bask in the light. We walk away and look to mankind for help rather than to God and God alone. Father, I know there's a balance. I don't want anyone here who's going through difficulty in their lives to feel that we are insensitive to the needs and the pains of this world. But God, we cannot, we cannot be silent about the fact that Jesus Christ is our hope in glory. Jesus, you are our peace. You are our hope. You are our love. You are what we have faith in, who we have faith in. Help us, Lord, lovingly to be bold. And if someone comes to us and is going through the darkness, that we will encourage them to come back into the light. Thank you, Father, for this congregation. Lord, last night I was filled with great concern for our community. Looking at what was going on last night, God, I can only believe that you had great tears from heaven. Looking at your creation wandering and walking in hopelessness, using some kind of drug to give them some appeasement for a brief period of time and then to wake up in the morning and still have that hopeless feeling and darkness in their life. God, stir our hearts to be light to a dark world. Stir our hearts to love those in our neighborhood, whether they seem lovable or not. Help us to be light by basking in the sunlight of Christ. 
thank you, Father God. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.